Good morning. This is Lisa Niver from We Said Go Travel, and I'm so honored and excited to be speaking today with New York Times best-selling author and Reese's Book Club author, Christy Tate. Hello. Hi, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Oh my goodness. It is such an honor. I have loved both your books so, so much. And I think I mean, I would love if you could talk a little bit to my audience about group because I just loved how you shared what an incredible, incredible process it is to be in group therapy and how challenging it is and just all the questions that came up for you. So tell people maybe a little bit about how did that happen that you wrote a whole book about how strangers saved your life in therapy? Sure. So I wrote group over the period of five years and I knew I was going to write about it when I I had originally gone to therapy because I was very, very lonely and I was very, very concerned that I was going to die alone. Like I really, the way that I talked about, it, I was like, I want a boyfriend. But what I was trying to say is I want a life. I want a family. I want people to be close to me, but I was scared and I didn't know how, and I didn't have a lot of money. And I was a law student and I ended up in group therapy to, to, two main reasons. One was a good friend of mine had changed and I saw a light go on in her eyes and I'm like, what is it? And she was like, it's my therapist. I do group. And I was like, ew, group. And then she told me the price and group is a, because you share the circle with other people and divide up the time. It was a lot cheaper and that appealed to my budget. And when I got there, the therapist told me, if you want to work on relationships, if you want to build up intimacy, if you want to change your life, group is the way to do it. And he was so sure and so confident. And I was the opposite of that. I was, I was like buying single funeral plots and I was 27 years old. So <laughs> I decided to hear the call. And I, I did originally think, well, I'll do this for a year. And then when I become a lawyer and make the big bucks, then I'll go get a real therapist and do real therapy. But it turned out I understood how potent it was within the first three months. And I stuck around and my life changed dramatically. And I could see the arc of, of what it had done to me. It reminded me, this is a very audacious claim, but Cheryl Strayed's wild. Her life changed as she walked the Pacific Coast Trail. It changed, she mourned, she grieved, she learned, she met herself out there. And that's what happened to me in therapy, except I just went back and forth to this little office in downtown Chicago, back and forth to therapy. And I thought maybe someone else would like to know that this is possible. And that's why I wrote the book. Oh my gosh, that's so beautiful. I I, I have been in group therapy and I, I understand what you're saying. And I think, especially in this time where we're still continuing on the COVID coaster, which I know is a lot about your second book, which we'll get to, but that, that people are really searching for how to get help. And yeah. I think that's really important. What you bring up is that therapy can be expensive. Yeah, real expensive. And I was not in a position where I felt like I could wait I was a, the beginning of my second year of law school. So I had all of second year and all of third year before I would have a full law job. I didn't, feel, I felt very precarious mentally and emotionally. And I'd started to have fantasies about like how I might end my life. And I'm like, I can't wait two years. Like I need something now and I don't have any money. So what do I do? I mean, group, group therapy is not free. So I had to take out extra loans and I just banked on it working and that my mental health had to become a priority because I scared myself. And I'm obviously very glad I did, but none of those decisions are easy. And I wanted to story them because a lot of people are in that position every single day. It's so true. We know we keep hearing in the news about people where we're so shocked that someone has taken their life and it, it is really, there are really hard situations for people. And I, I do also think in group, you, you talk about, you know, be, feeling like a misfit and, and feeling alone and the loneliness, but it's also, you tell funny stories. Can you say a little bit about the breaking of the plates? I love that part. <laughs> well, yes, I am very, very dramatic. I mean, that's just like, I don't know. I don't mean that in a pejorative way. I just mean, 
I'm a very sensitive person and I feel things really, really deeply. And once I got into group, it became to, it became safe for me to really explore the full extent of my rage, my loneliness, my sorrow, and my terror, which I'd just been shoving down. And I had disordered eating, which contributed to more repression. And when I got to group, I had a full permission slip from my therapist and my group to like, let's get it out. Let's play full out. So <laughs> when I went through, I went through a breakup that was very, very upsetting. And I, I, I was extra upset because I thought, well, I'm a good girl. I go to group. I do the work. I'm emotionally working on myself. Why did this man I love so much break up with me? I was horrified that those things could still happen to someone who was like in mental health treatment, which is absurd, <laughs> but that's what I thought. And I just, he dropped me off after telling me I was not the one and I was devastated. And I just picked every <laughs> every single dish out of my cabinet and threw it on the floor. And you know, that's that's expensive way to do rage. <laughs> And then I was ashamed. Then I was like, what have I done? I have no glasses. I have no plates. I have no platters. I threw a Thanksgiving platter on the floor that I bought at Walgreens for $9.99. And I was like, well, now what do I do? And I wanted to not be alone with the explosion of it all. So I put all the pieces in a bag and I took it to group and I put it in the middle of the, of the floor between all the chairs. I was like, this is what I did. And it's messy coming to life. And getting into rage and and going all out in your emotions is really messy. And I can't be the only one, maybe I'm the only one who's broken all my dishes, but I can't be the only one who's been surprised by the intensity of what I was holding on to. No wonder I was bulimic for years. Like that's all there's a lot going on inside of me. If I don't have a way to get it out, bad things happen. No, I think it's really so courageous of you to share the actual stories and you know I'm working on a memoir and I know for myself sometimes writing some of the pieces I literally used to write until I was pretty sure I was going to throw up and then I would lie on the floor yes yes it's a very people always ask me if it's cathartic to write and I think that's one word for it but it is a reliving it is a reliving even though there's a part of my brain that's crafting and it's making an object of my experiences on the page but like my soul is reliving it and it is extremely intense. And I have such a high regard for all memoirists for that exact reason, because I know what it feels like. And it is not for the faint of hearts. It is not for the faint of heart, but you struck a chord with so many people. As I said, you're a New York Times bestselling author. You were, you're in the club with Reese Witherspoon books. You were Amazon best book. So when the book came out, of course, you hoped you would reach people, but what happened when you were like, oh my God, I'm on the list of everybody? It was such a huge surprise. I I mean, I live in Chicago, so I'm not steeped in publishing. I read, read very widely. I'm a very enthusiastic reader, but I was new at being an author and I was a full-time lawyer when the book came out. And so I didn't understand. I didn't understand what was about to happen. I knew it was a huge deal that Reese Witherspoon was going to Put her name on my book and I was thrilled just beyond like I'm, I've never felt anything quite like that certainly not professionally but I was not I had no idea how many people would write to me with all kinds of feedback and, and sharing with me their therapy stories which I hold so so closely to my heart and some people are like your therapist is a terrible person and I accept that like I accept that people have very strong feelings about mental health treatment. Mostly what I wanted my book to do was, you know, shine a light for anybody who was like, had money problems and didn't, and, or individual wasn't working for them, but also like, let's have more discussion. Let's talk about this. Let's talk about what works and what might work for one person and not another. Cause all those, every single conversation peels back a little bit of stigma. So in terms of what happened, I'm still, like, I still get letters from readers and people are still discovering the book. And it is, it is the greatest joy. It is such a joy. I never dreamed. My biggest dream for my book is I hoped one day I would be shopping in Costco and I would see it <laughs> next to like, you know, Obama's book or something. And so this has exploded all of my bucket list dreams. Oh, wow. Well, okay. So let's talk about what happened after, because I was just in the lobby of Simon and & Schuster and I saw your new book right there in the display case. So 
you decided somehow to write another book. Yeah, I did. You know, even before group was published, even before I had a book deal, I knew I wanted to write about friendship because group is really all about how I straightened out romantically there. You know, I had, I had a lot of work to do along the way, like dealing with early trap trauma and eating stuff. But really I was like, where's my boyfriend? Where's my boyfriend? I want a husband. I want a family. I'm getting old, you know, like that's the engine of group. But Uh I really had also done a lot of work around female friendship and that had nothing to do with the boyfriend and the husband, whatever. And I really wanted to tell those stories in part because I had been crippled all my life by the idea that friendship is, if you're a girl and the right kind of girl, friendship is easy and you have lifelong friends and you have pods and you vacation with all your friends. And I just, I'm a little bit ill at ease in social relationships. And I wanted to write about some of my own bad behavior ghosting and being neurotic and insecure like I know I'm not the only person and I wanted to write in tribute to the notion of the work we do to get straight romantically can also be done in our friendships yes so you named your book BFF best friends forever and I I think one of the things you wrote that really spoke to me was about how one life can alter another, that friendships change us, but also that it felt like you were missing this secret code. Yes. That, I mean, I remember being in kindergarten. I mean, very young, watching other girls and maybe it was my community or just my particular vision, but I felt like the girls were best, other girls were like best friends and their moms were friends and they did stuff on the weekends and they were really embedded in each other's lives. And it looks like they were held so closely in their friendships. And I had no idea how to do that. I had, I had no clue. My mom didn't have friendships like that. And neither did my dad. And I, I didn't have the language at age five, six, seven to express longing like that. And I didn't have the skills. Like I did not know what it meant to be a good friend. And so I had to do, I had to make every mistake. Like I had to experiment with social climbing and then, you know, getting dumped and then dumping friends for a boy. Like all the things you're not supposed to do, I had to do them. (laughs) And I'm like, and I wanted that to be something that I, part of the work that I'm interested in as much as getting married is like, how to build a community. That's something that I'm still interested in to this day. I haven't, I haven't cracked the code just because I wrote a book about it and I'm better than I used to be. I believe it's my life's work to keep working on this. Well, I think one of the things that probably you see in group and and in the BFF book is you talk about the triangles, like mother and sister, or you have a friend and they have a friend and can we all be friends? Because I think the triangles whether someone's at work, you know, people talk a lot now, it's very in on social media, the work wife or the work yeah. as, you know, spouse. And, but I think all of that plays into it. And of course, now we're all managing all this on social too. Yeah. Oh yes. Oh my God. That It's so painful. Like my children are in middle school and they have their own relationships to friendships and social media. And They'll see things like, it's just like, they'll see things and it'll hurt their feelings. They're not involved. And I will say to them, me too. Everyone's at a writing conference and I'm not there. And I wasn't invited. That's how it feels. And I, I, it, uh, it, it upends me and it takes me down. And I don't have, I mean, I wish I had more wisdom for my kids. What I strive to have is like balance for myself, for my own soul, my own peace of mind. And when I first started telling people I was writing about female friendship, this woman I didn't know at a reading for group turned to me and she said, you better be writing about triangles. And I just laughed because I'm like, women know if you say friendship triangle to a woman, they're like, "Mm, very unstable, very unstable. (laughs) I'm like, exactly, exactly. And I, as you mentioned, I grew up with a mom and a sister. We also had a brother, but like the females form this triangle and I always viewed myself as on the outs and that infected all my friendships because I was sure I was going to be pushed out and I had to work through that as an adult in order to form healthy relationships Mm -hmm. and I I loved what you said about the inspiration you said broken bones 
and irreparable rifts belonged in middle school and not motherhood because yeah. you, you work to repair a bunch of relationships. Yes, I was really interested in, I mean, I was embarrassed that I would. I had gotten to be in my 40s, my 40s, and I was still so envious of other people's success or their bodies or their hair. Like it was so shameful. Like I was supposed to be a feminist and I had been in recovery and therapy all these years. I was a mother and I was so ashamed of my behavior. And what I learned, thank goodness, through all the work was, well, keeping it to myself is never going to work. It's just not going to work. Pretending it's not there, also a failure. And so what if I start writing about this, talking about this. And what the great blessing I got is one of my friends that I knew from recovery, like tapped me on the shoulder and said, you know, I think we have a lot in common. And I think it's time for both of us to work on friendships. And I had just settled down with my about to be husband. And I was like, oh my God, can we just, can you let me catch my breath from being so sad about being single? And she was kind of like, no, let's go. And I was like, okay. So that, that is, that is what is remarkable. I also wanted to put this story out in the world. Like in group, there's a Ivy League trained therapist and he's he's crazy and he's exotic and he takes up a lot of space. And with BFF, it was me and a friend. Just, we were both bungling along and we decided to help each other. We don't have degrees. We didn't pay each other. We just decided let's stop telling ourselves we stink at friendship. And let's do something different and let's do it together. And our lives changed. Yes. The power of committing to another person to try to be better. Exactly. Exactly. It's like, it's kind of that simple and that hard all at the same time. It is very hard and very simple. I agree with you, but people can come find you. I know you've been on a book tour. Yes. Yes. But tell people, I know you've been having, you can't be uninvited when you run the workshop. So tell people they can come work with you. Yes. Writers. Yes. I've started doing some writing workshops and they've been just amazing. Like the most amazing people have come forth and they want to write their stories. And I like, I, I really only write about relationships. So I'm sort of like, let's do it together. Let's get in a room together and tackle the hard ones, especially those people we think, well, I have to wait till they die before I can write about them. And I'm like, mm, let's, let's, let's do this together. So I'll be doing something. We don't have dates yet, but something in the Hudson Valley in fall of 2023. And then oh, right after MLK day, MLK junior day in January of 2024, I'm going to have a second annual, second annual, um, event in Palm Springs that'll span like Monday to Friday. And we did that last year and it was a really wonderful experience. So I try to draw people who might want to get to the sunshine in January because I live in Chicago. That's what I want. And so if you check my website, when the dates and signups will be there and I would love to see any new faces. And so tell people your website name is. Sure. My website is christytate.com. And uh, can people find you on social media? Where where do you hang out and share wisdom? Sure. <laughs> wisdom, yes. Um, all the wisdom comes down. I only do, I really am most active on Instagram. Um, and my Instagram is Christy O. Tate. And I'm usually there posting all kinds of whack, whatever, whatever's going on. And would love to have any kind of reader engagement that brings me great joy. And I know on your website, people can find if their book club is reading group, you have a whole book club guide. Yes. The, the best way, if you want me to zoom in or if you're local to me, I'm happy to come by. It's so fun to go to a book club. Um, we've gotten into some very, what I love about book clubs is people are not afraid to say, I had this in this issue. Like, I don't mind that engagement is is so brave for a reader to look me in the eye and be like I really hated this and I'm like awesome I want to hear more about it like you don't have to like all my stuff anyway um I find that really invigorating and brave so it reminds me of group therapy <laughs> um and yeah so email me the email there's a form on my website you can reach out to me and we can set something up that's so amazing so people can read your book and they can learn more about you and the book is also an audiobook 
Yes, both books appear in the audio format. Right now, BFF is just in hardback, but you can also get it on Libra. I think that's the indie bookstore version of Audible, but of course, Audible as well. And um, hardback and then group is available in all the formats in several different languages if you are not an English speaker. Oh, wow, that's so exciting. Yeah, it's pretty fun. And and is there, what happens once you're in the Reese, Reese Witherspoon book club? Do you guys have like, chats with the other authors or yeah you know it's it's a real bonding experience because Reese and her company Hello Sunshine and the Reese's Book Club they're really good to their authors and they have giveaways and and like online events and there's a really wonderful app that anybody can join but you can find out you know what the new uh, what the new book picks are. We don't get to find out early, but a bunch of us have bonded who were like around each other. And there's a whole, there's a sense of camaraderie. And there was talk um, in 2020 about like one day doing a retreat with everyone. And I'm just like holding my breath, waiting for that because how amazing would that be? Like, oh my gosh. <laughs> so hopefully one day that will come to pass. Yes. And I know um, just before we go, I'd love for you to just talk a little bit. I think that being in the COVID coaster, that it's been such a hard time for people feeling lonely and alienated. And obviously book club is a good way to get together. And I think some of the inspiration for your friendship forensics was COVID. So yeah, I don't know if you could speak a little bit about how you I don't know if it's the right thing to say, turn the corner during COVID or like reconnecting that maybe a couple of tips, like what could people do if they're just feeling like it's everything's so hard right now for them? Yeah, I definitely agree with that. There's two things I feel that's really, that are manageable starting points, right? Because you can't build a community in one dinner and that's so overwhelming. One thing is I've, I've started doing friends when they pop into my mind, even if I only have five minutes, I just call them up and I say, I've got seven minutes till I pick up my daughter or till the pasta boils. And I wanted to say, hi, what can you tell me in seven minutes? What can you tell me about your life? What do I need to know about what's new and exciting in your life? And people, I've never had anybody be like, well, unless you have 45 minutes, we are not talking. I mean, everyone's busy. Everyone's crunched. So there's something about the little the, the snatches of time that I used to just like, I would just stand in the kitchen. Maybe I would be scrolling, making myself miserable, low key and stirring the pasta. And now I'm like, I can have a connection. Like it, it, the idea that it has to be so long has crippled me. Right. And the other thing for me is I'm very scared to initiate socially. That's something that's true about me. Like I'm inhibited. Yeah. I have lots of reasons, but and I'm working on that. But one thing that's been very helpful is like when I hear an invitation, because lots of invitations come my way that I used to just like bat away or or not hear in some psychological way. Like, what if what if I just said yes? Like I just give myself the goal to say yes. If someone says we should do lunch, I pull out my calendar and say, what about this day? Now I may not be the person who's really good at saying we should go to coffee, but what I can do is hear the bid for connection and then take it up and keep carrying it. And once I realized how often people are offering to connect, I realized it was all right in front of me. It's really right in front of me. And I bet that's true for lots of people, even as isolated as we are, we're still in the COVID coaster. My community is still extremely, we're, there's places in my community where we're still masking. So I get it. It is not easy. But like when someone would say, oh, I would like to go on a walk. I'd be like, I would love to walk Saturday morning, just like follow it up. And if you're walking anyway, like why not? Right. So those two things start somewhere and five minute phone calls that has been really, really enriched my social connections. Now I'm wondering if the next book's called five minute phone calls. <laughs> Maybe. Oh, I like the way you think. <laughs> Well, I mean, when you have two hits, you got to go for more, right? Yeah. Yes. Yes. I definitely hear that for sure. All right. Well, I am so appreciative that you spent this time with us. And I know that your books have meant so much to me and so much to other people. So thank you for walking through all of the shame and pain and tears to share your incredible story and really help people. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. This has been a total joy. <laughs>